hashtag really? Well, this is old Pastor Kelly coming at you, and I got a little sermon or a discussion or lesson or whatever you want to call it today. A little bit long, longer than normal. I met a new friend in Christ uh, a couple of days ago on the YouTube chat. His dilemma moved me to do a small message on the subject of divorce. A subject that has unfortunately affected more than likely every person that's listening to me right now. My only hope is that uh, this helps you and uh, blesses you in some way. Amen. In my opinion, divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Though to some, not only is it un unpardonable, it's the uttermost stigma a man or woman can possess. Some denominations, their, their, their policies are about not ordaining a, a divorced person no matter what the reason for it happening. It doesn't matter. You're, you're done. Now, in, in my opinion... They are losing out on prime opportunities, just opportunities for people that will just go out and testify. For the scripture does not does not indicate in any direct statement about this. I mean, you have okay, you go back to Exodus and you get your "Thou shalt not steal." You know, you get your "Thou shalt not bear false witness." You know why? It does not say thou shalt not preach if thou is divorced. <laughs> Try thinking outside of the box. See how this sets with you. With that line of thought, you will welcome an ex-con, a murderer, uh, someone who finally got released from prison after spending 40 years, come to Christ and, and live in a transformed life but you endure, you're ordaining them as a minister and welcome them in your fold, which is fine. I mean, I don't have a problem with that, but you, you'll do that. But here's the thing. But not someone that's been divorced. Okay, what sort of sense does that make at all? It doesn't, does it? I mean, any sort of reformed criminal who has found Christ in prison and now wants to preach can and be ordained uh, be anointed and ordained hands laid on the whole nine yards but uh, if that person had been divorced forget it throw it out it's done in most most denominations that way you allow this over someone divorced does that make any kind of biblical sense doesn't not really I will say this. I welcome them also, along with the divorced minister. Now, there's a lot of folks hold the opinion of the, like this. Did the, is the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken? Did the divorce occur before you became a Christian and then answered the call to God to join the ministry? Or did the divorce happen after you were called? Now, most folks, if that, if that happens that way, then you're out. You're done. I kind of lean toward that opinion with certain circumstances coming up. You know, you can't help if your wife runs off as another man to, you know, abu dabu or whatever. You can't help that. That's a little bit of a different story, but now if that does occur... And you want to continue the ministry, you should either rectify that with your wife or stay single. But it shouldn't evolve you from being a minister, I don't believe. It should it should keep you dissolve you from being a minister. This may sound judgmental or legalistic, it may be a little, but it's a whole lot less harsh than what most people think of if you got a D in your name any which way, shape, or form, you cannot be a preacher, you can't preach the gospel. You can be a lay person. You can't even be a deacon. You know, you can be an upstanding member, possibly. Some churches, you can't even be that. Some churches, you can't even be a member if you got a divorce. But if you were a murderer or 
an adulterer or a pedophile or a thief or a lawyer or a liar and they're one and the same, you come right in. Have a seat. What kind of sense does that make, folks? The problem is this. Well, it's not really a problem. It's a good thing. The, some of the best preachers I've ever heard, the hellfire brimstone preachers, I mean, flat preach the gospel, know the gospel inside out, upside down and sideways, at church every Wednesday and every Sunday, every service, no matter if they're half dead, they're there, they're preaching the gospel. The sweat is rolling off of them, and the, and the Lord's words are running out their mouth as loud as they can go. Those folks, some of those best ones I've ever heard, I have the pleasure of shaking hands or witnessing to or witnessing with, were reformed, repented drunkards that had been divorced. Can I get an amen out of anybody on that one? Amen. You probably have deserved, thank you, honey. That's my wife. You probably have discerned by now my position on this subject. Seeing how I am saved by the grace through faith, washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, and I am a reformed, repented, divorced, happily remarried, ex-drunkard, who was called by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. Amen. I think the reasons for divorce situations are important. I do think some of the reasons are very important. It can be due to one or both persons' sinfulness in committing adultery, womanizing, cheating on each other, or other forms of being unfaithful. The Internet has created many, many, many new ways of adultery. All you guys that listen to this, and some of you women that see them half-naked people on your Facebook feed, and it flashes in your mind, oh, Lord, you want to see the rest of them? That's adultery. You done committed adultery to that person on your husband or on your wife. You know, this is very, you know, it, but, you know, you're welcome to come to church, aren't you, and if you get forgiven them sins, but let a divorced man or woman enter your church or your folder. Oh, the whispering and the gossip and the backbiting, they start right away. You can hear it. You hear them walk in your door and you can hear a pin drop as they cross the aisle. And then you hear, <laughs> and that person, they sit down at the back of the church a lot of the time because they're so ashamed. But they are just as a repentant sinner as you are. They're just as repentant and forgiven sinner as you are. Because you know what? A lot of folks you forget all have sinned and fell short of the glory of our precious Lord Jesus. Careful Christian counseling will help a lot of people get past this want to divorce. It's a divorce culture. As I stated at the beginning of this, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's not a person that hears this that has not had someone in their family or their friendship, touched by the evil D word. You know, sinful motivation will cause a person to divorce their spouse. It's just, it's terrible. I mean, it's, it's there, it's in your face, it's on your TV, it's on your phone, it's in your workplace. You can't go out your door without seeing some sort of temptation, praise God. And you know what? We're all in the flesh and we all at one time or another in our lives have failed to that temptation, whether it is adultery or drinking or lying or stealing or cheating. We've all failed to something because there's none of us have lived a sinless life. It's not going to happen. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Thank you, honey. Again, if a murderer or criminal or someone who committed, committed fornication had sex outside of marriage, a thief, a liar, or any other type of sinner can repent of their sins, come to Christ, be forgiven, be restored, be filled with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit of the righteousness of the Lord. Can they be called by God, who is our Almighty, can call whoever who He likes, whatever He likes, 
to be a minister. Hmm. Go, those, those sins remind me, does, does any of those sins remind you guys of anything? Any of those crimes or sins remind you anyone? How about a murderer? How about murder? Let's go with that one. Right, let me let me throw a name out at you. Moses. Hmm. How about a liar and a deceiver? Yeah. Let me throw you out another name. Jacob. Do you remember the adulterer, David? How about uh, all those wives? Hmm. Man of one wife. I think not. Should we even bring up Solomon? Pride, pride, pride. If everybody's listening to this, are right, thinking they're leading the most sinless life there ever was, I guarantee you one time in your life you have held pride above anything else. Pride when you look in that mirror to fix your hair. Pride in your appearance. We all have pride of some sort. You know. But a person who has been through a divorce they're exception. They're excluded from all this forgiveness. When it comes to being called to ministry, what kind of sense does that make, folks? Obviously, that was a rhetorical question. Can we base our whole view of our church policy on one verse of Scripture? Must be the husband of one wife. Well, to me, God, God's exclusion of anyone divorcing, is, is, is that mean God's exclusion of anyone divorced from the ministry? I want you to look up the cross reference and interpretation of that one verse. And I think you're going to find this. Does it refer to divorce? Only in a few instances does any scholars say that that's what it means. I don't believe that's what it means. I believe it means exactly what most scholars say it means. It has multiple, it means multiple wives, which means to be married to more than one wife at a time, having two, three, four, or five wives. Which, to me, makes more sense, since the Judeo-Christian view is and was in a one man, one woman in marriage. Well, you guys are going to make up your own mind, and I, most of my friends and folks that follow me and has known me for years is going to be, you know, went to the same church as I do, so they're probably going to disagree with what I just said, and that's fine, that's your right. This disagreement's been around for hundreds of years. Actually, almost 500 years to be exact. King James was on the side of the divorce, folks. That's how you got your beloved King James on the Bible. My goodness gracious, don't tell the KJV only folks I said that. I pray this message has helped you. All in some way. And, uh, I'm going to pray for y'all, and you pray for me. May God bless you one and all.